part of what I love about this work is the dancing on the edge of the cliff. We're not hacks. We're not just playing covers of our old songs. We are here to explore a frontier. But if you can't enjoy that, don't. Don't do that. Either make work for yourself or engage in the market. Today, we are delighted to welcome Seth Godin to the podcast. Seth writes and teaches about marketing, business, and creativity. He has published 16 best selling books, writes one of the world's most popular blogs, has built several businesses, and created multiple online courses. He's also been, for more than 17 years, my personal guru and mentor, even though he doesn't know anything about that. So, I have read every one of his books read his blog religiously, and they have guided my decisions as I built my businesses. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce him to all of you. So thank you so much, Seth, for all the help you've given me without even knowing it. Seth's latest book is The Practice, Shipping Creative Work. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So welcome, Seth. Thank you very much. Well, I'm thrilled to be here, and I need to thank both of you for the beauty and inspiration you bring to the world. Uh, I feel terrible that I'm taking you away from your painting right now. (laughs) Thank you very much. We're professional artists, obviously, painters, and we both really enjoyed the book. And you often write about art as, in more broad terms, speaking sometimes to business audiences or entrepreneurs. And so we thought it would be interesting to dig into some of these ideas in the book as they relate specifically to fine art. And for anybody watching on video, this is the book, The Practice, Shipping Creative Work. So all those post-it notes. You had a question. Oh yeah, look at all those. That just proves I've swatted. You had a question, Alice, to begin with. Yeah, well, I was just interested. I mean, your background is quite rounded. You've come from um, a different background where you explore all these ideas, but coming to this now, this idea of shipping creative work and the practice, why is this book the book for now? Why is it relevant and important for you to get to this point and start starting to talk about creativity now? Well, it's partly where I started. Um, My mom was the first woman on the board of the Albright Knox Art Museum in Buffalo. I grew up surrounded by Jasper Johns and Marisol and Louise Nevelson and uh, hundreds of other contemporary artists. And the thing is that most people who paint aren't artists, they're painters and they're different. And we are living in a topsy-turvy world filled with injustice, filled with insecurity, filled with tragedy. And many of us would like things to get better. And we're not going to get them better because some space alien is going to land on this planet and fix everything. It's going to get better because people creatively solve problems that other people think can't be solved. And if we can solve problems, turn on a light, inspire just 10 other people, and you multiply that enough times, that's everyone. And uh, so this book was many years in the making. And when I reread it, toward the beginning of the pandemic, I could have canceled the book, but I didn't have a word in it I wanted to change. Because I think that what we need to do is unhook our phones and get back to work of leading and connecting. And I call that art. And sometimes the person who does that has a paintbrush. Okay, so it's a very, it's a broad approach to art and creative thinking rather than specifically what Louise and I do, which is the application of paint to make something and we're going to we're maybe going to try and pull you back into that and how oh, those ideas I'd be delighted really let's let's relevant. talk all about that because I yeah. love that topic I have to broaden it because so many people want to yeah. let themselves off the hook and say I'm not an artist Louise is an artist Alice is an artist and yeah. I'm I think that's a ridiculous place to hide because we can agree that poets are artists and we can agree that uh humanitarian leaders are art and so you know pretty soon being an artist is a choice yeah. And I'd love to explore why I can make the assertion that most painters aren't artists, but I'm going to let you guys drive. So that was actually I'm... going to be my question. I was waiting for a second to jump in and say, hang on, why, why aren't most painters artists? There isn't a shortage of paintings in the world. I've been to um, Dauphin, which is a little village outside of Shenzhen, China, where they make all the iPhones. And in Dauphin, they paint one third of all the oil paintings in the world. 
and you can buy the Mona Lisa for $29. <laughs> but it's not the Mona Lisa, obviously, that the paintings we see hanging in hotel rooms are not art. They're just paintings. And the reason that so many well-meaning, hardworking people who have a paintbrush get trapped is they actually have two things they're doing. One thing they're doing is trying to express themselves with paint, but the other thing they're doing is they are hooked on selling their work, not necessarily selling it for money, but selling it for feedback, showing it to other people and getting applauded for it. That paralyzes people, that pushes people not to become Richard Serra, but to become a hack who's busy painting paintings as fast as they can in Dauphin and railing at the fact that they can't get a gallery, et cetera, et cetera. I think we have to get past that and realize you have two jobs if you're going to try to do it professionally and only one of them involves the transaction. Which, that's not nice. Well, no, it's so interesting because it's great. This is constantly comes up. Both of us lead different artist communities and both of us have those people who say, I can't sell my work. I don't understand why. And what's happening currently in the art world is what's happened in a lot of other industries in the past. We just caught up slower. Everybody can figure out how to set up an Instagram account. Everybody can do a newsletter. Everybody can do the email marketing, which a few of us were only doing before. And it seems to me that there are several ideas that you talk about that are so valuable for artists to think about and one of them is an idea that you you call in another book the purple cow can you tell us what a purple cow is sure um if you're in london you could head to my friend apollonia's bakery poulain her father lionel started it uh in france and it became the most important bakery in the country and when he died uh in a tragic crash I wanted to dedicate a book to him, but I didn't have a book. So I had to write a book so I could dedicate a book to him. <laughs> and what the book is about is the fact that in a post-TV world, in a post-scarcity world, the things that succeed aren't the things that get advertised, the things that get shelf space. They're the things that we choose to talk about. And if we choose to talk about something, the word spreads. And that is what marketing is now. It is not interrupting people. It is when your fans decide that the work you're doing is something that they will benefit if they talk about it. Hmm. And, you know, when I'm uh, showing up as an uninvited docent at a museum, walking down the hall, giving people a tour of the art, I am talking about the life of Marcel Duchamp because it makes me feel good, not because I owe Marcel anything. He's dead, right? But that act of being able to associate with something that's on the wall and feel a story that makes you want to tell somebody else, that's what people are buying. They're not buying something decorative. And so I think the, the place to start is this. Um, looking at a painting is free. In fact, most people who paint would happily pay someone to look at their painting if they could afford it. Owning the painting is what costs money. So what that means is that buying a canvas is a souvenir of the way it made you feel to look at the canvas. It's the souvenir edition. The looking is, and what that means is if you expect to sell your work, it has to be a souvenir worth owning. And that's how you go from, this is a 39 pound thing that sits on your kitchen wall to make it look a little prettier too. This is a 39,000 pound canvas that establishes your status and affiliation and role in society at the same time that it is giving you a story to tell the people who come over. And isn't there somewhere in the middle of that though? I think you're absolutely right. And, and I've, I've always seen, and when you make and sell your work, particularly actually when you do it face-to-face -face with your audience and your buyers rather than through a gallery, one of the extreme joys of that is you get to see that happen. You get to see that happen in somebody looking at your work. And it, it kind of completes the circle for me. It's a really... It's a really um, powerful thing, but I think it's it's also difficult to anticipate it when you're perhaps at the beginning of the process. And we've all got to get through those stages where we're not getting that reaction from people yep. for our work. We're, you know, we're not achieving that. And there's an element of frustration 
in that that's a, a very it's a difficult thing to take on board because we actually have to be pretty brutal with ourselves at that point and accept that just maybe not quite as good as we want it to be yet and you've just got to stick with it long enough for that to happen but I know we were talking about this earlier one of the difficult things is whether you you as an artist are making that work for you for yourself to have that reaction or for your audience to have a reaction and when it gets handed over too far and too led by what you expect somebody else to do as a result of it then maybe you've lost the plot a little bit ding 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 that was brilliant yes so so many ways to decode this i'll first i'll tell you the story of my friend audrey um one of the challenges that painters have is we over index on fame being a famous painter gives you an enormous amount of leeway and freedom and leverage. And a lot of times when someone who feels insecure about the work, about under, who doesn't know who Clement Greenberg was, who doesn't uh, feel comfortable talking about the work, but if they see something by a famous artist, then it's okay. Mm. And um, so my friend Audrey is a super talented visionary and was having trouble in the New York City gallery scene getting anointed as the next famous artist. And so I egged her on and she actually took me up on it. She had some of her work printed up at uh, two and a half by three and a half feet, got some wallpaper uh, paste and went to New York City and just put it on the sides of uh, construction sheds, just put it on the wall just mounted her own paintings over and over again on the walls of New York City, and then watched as people walked by. And she had a gallery showing in New York City. No one could stop her. And as soon as you took commerce out of the equation, yeah. interesting things happen. You know, my friend Shepard Ferry has been arrested 30 times, putting his work out into the world for free. Um, you know, the legend of Banksy completely pierces the mythology of the art market mm -hmm. because Banksy's work is expensive precisely because it's often free and precisely because he's famous, even though no one knows Richard's real name. And so when you, when you decode all of this, what you realize, as Alice pointed out, is at some point, you're either going to have to say, I made this because I'm proud of it and I don't care what you think. Or you have to say, I see how the market works and I'm going to make a living doing this and I don't care what I think. But getting both is really rare. Do you think it's possible? It's totally possible. I mean, I think someone like Richard Serra has stuck to uh, his vision for a long time, but I would probably say that for the last 20 years, he's been playing cover versions of his work, not doing what he felt like because to get paid half a million dollars to make something out of core 10 steel is a good living. And at some point you say, I'm Richard Serra with a capital R and a capital S, and this is what Richard Serra needs to make. Mm -hmm. And we've certainly seen this with Jeff Koons because every five or so years he shifts his vernacular and he almost goes bankrupt because it doesn't look like it's supposed to look. And the yeah. market says, I don't want this, even if you're famous. And then he comes through on the other side often, but not always. And so that's part of what I love about this work is the dancing on the edge of the cliff. We're not hacks. We're not just playing covers of our old songs. We are here to explore a frontier. But if you can't enjoy that, don't. Don't do that. Either make work for yourself or engage in the market. And the last part of my rant about this is I would love to talk about Hilma off, off Klimt if you saw her recent show. I, I don't know what it was like to be an upper-class woman in Sweden in the 1920s, but I cannot applaud her bravery as an artist because she hid her work for 40 years. And I can only imagine what would have happened to the world of contemporary art, your work, if she had had the guts to share her work because it would have opened doors for women. It would have opened doors for expression 
And, uh, but she wanted to paint for herself and five other people. That's her privilege. But at some point, it's not art if you don't ship it. This is where I got a little bit hung up and I'd love you to clarify a little bit more about this. So I, I've never, I got stuck on the, the balance between making something honest, on the edge, genuine, that you believe in and thinking who it's for, which you talk in the book about think who it's for. Mm -hmm. And I, I have never made a good painting when I was thinking about the audience. If I start thinking, is someone going, are people going to like this? Is this right? I go off the rails. It gets boring. Then I have to come back and mess it up again and start again. How do we, and I'm sure that's the same for writers and, and for ev every art work. So how do we balance, unless we want to be, you know, a pop band with a number one hit, if we want to actually be more serious, how do we walk that line between keeping in mind an audience and making something genuinely truthful to ourselves? Okay, so this is the part that makes people uncomfortable, but here we go. <laughs> I would like to argue that if it weren't for Helen Frankenthaler and Clifford Still, your work would not look like your work. And if you had lived 200 years ago, there's no way this is what you would have thought of as your true expression. Mm -hmm. you're, already, you're already reacting to yeah. what's in the world. And you're, just not, you're not telling yourself you're doing that, but you are. And so the only question we're having here is a matter of degree, right? What we're saying is, should I go all the way to fit in and just be like a boy band out of Korea making yet another clone of what happened? Or should I go all the way in the other direction doing work that reminds somebody of nothing that is completely and wholly never been seen before, which means that I will be rejected by every single person who sees it? Or am I somewhere in between? Yeah. And for almost all of us, we're in between, right? Like my books are written in traditional words with traditional sentences published by traditional publishers, but I am not writing something that most people call trite because I'm doing things that make people like you uncomfortable on purpose. But I didn't write something that could have been considered current 50 years from now or 50 years ago because we live in this moment. So all I'm trying to point out to people is uh, as soon as you pick your audience, you pick your truth. As soon as you pick your audience, you pick your work. Be very careful about who your audience is. If you want to please bidders at Sotheby's, you have signed up for something. If you want to please someone who's going to sell your thing in multiples to folks who have furniture from Ikea, you've decided the kind of work you pick your audience, pick your future. I think it's almost impossible, isn't it? Well, it is impossible to create anything though without any influence you know, your level of understanding from history or art history, it's, you know, that might be varied, you know, where you live, the vernacular of what you see outside of your window, what you want to use. And to a degree, that and the language that we use in our work, whether it's written verbal language like you do in writing, or whether it's uh, form, painting, materials, brush strokes which of course you know they might be influenced by all sorts of people but they're they're part of the language that we use and I think you're right you kind of do it there's a little bit in order to fit in because you've got that slight aspirational gap of where you want to be given of what you understand to be on a higher level than you and I think I find certainly that that aspirational element can be quite an important driver because that's almost what prompts me and promotes me to always be trying to make my work better against whatever criteria I'm judging it against at the time and I think that 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 changes but I think it's it's a very difficult thing to avoid that and I think I am I think we have to be honest about where it fits in with our process but I think it's kind of inevitable that it's there somewhere. I think that you are uh, more introspective than most people who have your craft. A lot of people who do what you do are afraid to examine it 
because they're worried that if they do, it will go away. Mm. And I believe if we examine it too much, that may be true, right? Yeah. But um, you know, if you wanted to write thriller novels, I think it pays to understand deeply the genre, to analyze yeah. James Bond and all the rest chapter by chapter by chapter to draw graphs and charts of how it goes, of how it fits together. And then put it aside now that you've understood the genre and do your work, right? So when I look at a piece of yours, like I Don't Make the Rules, which is stunning and has levels of depth to it that most people could only dream of. If I wanted to say, it's derivative in a negative way I could, but I want to say it's derivative in the most positive, positive possible way because it reminds me of what came before mm -hmm. in a way that makes me thrilled to see where you took it. And it opens the door for a whole new levels of understanding that I wouldn't be able to have if I hadn't seen what came before. Yeah. And we can embrace that because the fact is human beings need genre to make decisions. Genre does not mean generic. Genre just means it rhymes with what came before. So when you talk about finding the audience, I think I got a little bit stuck on the way I think about it when I sell a course, which is who is the person this is for? I know how old she is. I know where she lives. I know her problems. I know what, how to talk to her. We're talking more about, in this case, find an audience, don't look for a painter, don't look for an audience who's looking for a still life of traditional flowers painted in Renaissance colors because they're not gonna like a modern abstract painting. But so that's as, that's as far I'm taking it as you want us to define audience. I want you to go way further than that. Okay. I, don't think, I don't think any painter who cares about her self-esteem should ever show work at an outdoor craft fair painting show. I think it's- Well, I'm gonna disagree with you there because think, that's often where you begin. It doesn't mean yeah, to no, say no. that it's where you end up, but skip it. it's your route in, no? Skip it, skip it. That is not the route in. That is, that you, there is a difference between Joni Mitchell honing her craft in a uh, coffee shop setting on her way to getting a deal with a record label and a painter showing work to people who came out on a beautiful day post COVID to go for a stroll who are looking for traditional pictures of daisies and have 39 pounds to spend. You don't get from there to people who are buying real art as a souvenir of a feeling of emotional shift for 10,000 pounds. That is not the journey because you're exposing yourself to people who aren't there for you and finding the people who are there for you. No, you don't start with 10,000 pound canvases, but the people who are, are at that show have a different problem that they need solved. And so the example I'll give you is uh, my friend, Abby Ryan. So Abby uh, 10 or 15 years ago started painting an oil painting every day. She's a much more traditional painter than you. She paints still lifes. And she began by videotaping the work and teaching other people how she did the work. And then at the end of each day, selling that painting on eBay for $100. And this work of generously leading, exposing her method, showing people how she constructed it, wasn't shown to people who didn't understand craft and art, who weren't just walking around some craft show who were about to buy an ashtray. They were shown to people who cared about this, who didn't have the money to go to Sotheby's, but wished they did, right? Mm -hmm. And that the paintings went from $100 to $200 to $500 to $3,000 to Oprah Magazine, to her being a professor at a university and having this following of tens of thousands of people because now she's famous, she is the Abby Ryan, right? That path made her better at every step along the way because the feedback she got mm -hmm. was the feedback she needed to make herself better. Whereas if you just put up an easel at some craft fair, the kind of people who are sneering as they walk by, they're not sneering because you're bad. They're sneering because they feel insecure. 
They don't understand your work. They came looking for something that reminded them of their parents, not something that reminded them of possibility and, and uh, avant-garde and taste and anything else. So don't expose yourself to people just because it's easy to get into the fair if it's not going to make your work better. Let me put this to you then, because I think that there might, there might be a difference in, and I think I know that there is a difference between um, in the States, what an art fair is and how we talk Probably true. In, in the UK. But what I have learned from doing those things, and they weren't outside, they were inside, but basically you pay your money, you get your pitch, you have walls, nice white walls you can put your work on but one of the things that I've learned is one of the things that exactly it shows you talk about in the book which is it's almost to me it feels like when you're a blacksmith and you have to temper metal and you've got to make it harder it's like to show up to stand there with your work and expose it yes to to make all the decisions that you have to do in order to display it. And you learn a lot about your work when you see it all up, you know, with no, yep. you know, not only do you learn, but you learn really by throwing yourself in at the deep end that there are a lot of people who will walk past and they will give you barely two seconds of looking. And yet within that whole weekend, there will be those people who resonate with you and find you. And some of those are, st are still following. They're still interested. They still come back years later. Yeah, we agree. I totally okay. agree. That in the, the, There's one of those shows in New York that I usually go to called the Affordable Art Fair. Very similar, and, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not what I was talking about, but okay. I totally agree. Pick that audience and those people. So what is good taste, right? This is worth discussing because Louise, when I saw it, uh, your, your work after you reached out, I was an instant fan and Alice yours as well, because you both have really good taste. And that's only in my opinion. And what it means mm -hmm. to have good taste is to know what your audience will like 10 minutes before they do. <laughs> and <laughs> and yeah. you need to expose your good taste to people who share it. And if you go to the gim crackery place that sells caramel corn ashtrays and uh, jewelry that was made in the backyard, those people don't share your sensibility. So you will be crushed if you show up at one of those places. And the same thing is also true if you show up at the Mary Boone Gallery. Because the Mary Boone Gallery, the people who are coming are asking the following questions. If I buy this today, how much will it be worth tomorrow? And if I buy this today, will it increase my status in front of my friends who I don't like that much? Those are the two <laughs> driving questions. And I remember when she jumped the shark, there was a show I went to in Soho, New York, 20, 25 years ago. And it was a display of logs uh, that were about six inches across and five feet tall, just cut from trees that had glass eyes in them. And as a conceptual piece of art, I thought it was a really cool idea, you know, druids and the whole thing, but they were $150,000 a log. And the only reason anyone was buying them was because they figured that after Mary Boone sold out, they would be worth $300,000 mm -hmm. a log. Mm -hmm. You don't go there if you have a, a different sort of craft and skill the way the two of you do, because you will be rejected and that won't help. Yeah. It's, but it's a very difficult thing to place. I think when you're at the beginning, you know, we all have to accept that we're at the beginning of something. And I think what you're saying is just be aware, have a mind on the end game of where it is that you want to head towards and don't accept second best for yourself on the way there. I think you should also be honest with yourself about, are you looking for feedback? And if so, what kind? So if you say to me, you want to make a million dollars doing this, then let's be honest about what kind of work you should make. If you say to yourself, I want the following review about my work in art news, then let's be honest about the path you should go on. Because if you don't do that, then the first time someone doesn't like your work, who wasn't on your list anyway, you'll be crushed. And so I decided a bunch of years ago, to fire the New York Times bestseller list. I did it in writing. I pointed out how corrupt they were. And I decided not to read my Amazon reviews. 
because if someone gives me a one-star review on Amazon, all it means is that I didn't write the book for them. Mm -hmm. Not that my book wasn't any good. And so my life is better because I didn't need those things to um, be happy by insulating myself from them. I get to do my work. Whereas if I was on Twitter, if I was reading those reviews, I'd be crushed every day and I'd stop. On that note, you have a phrase in the book I love, reassurance is futile. And yes. I see this so often where people share their work and they want, all they want is for everyone to say it's good. But it doesn't matter how many people say it's good. One person says it's bad and they're thrown completely off. So tell us about reassurance is futile. Well, like a warm bath, it's very pleasant. The problem <laughs> is that if someone tells you that everything is going to be okay, if they predict the future, if they say this is good and everyone is going to like it, that feels good until the future arrives. And when it does, we realize it didn't work and we need more reassurance. And there is never enough. So instead of looking for more of it, what we can do is divorce ourselves from it and realize that what we really need is to trust ourselves. That if we trust ourselves, that is sufficient. Not that it's all going to work, because it's not. Not that we're going to get a one person show at the Guggenheim, because we won't. But if we say, I have a practice and I trust the practice, the practice is the best I can make the practice, and that is enough, then it's enough. And we can go back to work because we have a practice, not because we're seeking reassurance. This is the other question I had for you was, you said the first step is to separate the process from the outcome, not because we don't care about the outcome, but because we do. Love, love it. And Alice, I know you loved the fly fishing story, which is on that topic. Can you just talk to us about that? Because when it comes to painting, having a practice or having a process that you stick to every day is, is so many people are focused on the outcome. I've got to finish some paintings so I can show them to people. Talk about that. All right, so which, which would be a better way for you to spend the next few years of your life? Either uh, every morning when you wake up, there's a new painting in the garage that just magically arrived and you can sell it. Or you have a practice that involves understanding genre, doing the work, connecting with other people, improving the work, doing the work again, and none of your work sells. For me, the second one is the only one to have. Yeah. The first one is empty. The first one is just, oh, I got a result. That's like going to the fish store to buy fish instead of catching a fish. Yeah. And the story in the book about fly fishing was basically, I got um, the guide to give me a fly that had no hook because I wanted to learn to cast. I wanted to learn to be present in the moment. I didn't want to be judged by an animal whose brain is the size of a pea. Right? I wanted instead to just be there. And I knew that if I had these fish in the water who I had given power to, I would ruin my day because I would be trying to will them to yeah. take action. And I had a great day and I learned to cast better than most people who were on the trip because they were busy willing the fish to bite the hook. And when a fish did bite the hook, they thought they had done a good job mm. when in fact they had just gotten lucky. And so the problem with judging yourself based on the outcome is you will confuse luck with a good practice mm. and they're not the same. And one way to think about this is what would it be like to be a trauma surgeon or an emergency room doctor? Because we know patients die all the time. But if a patient dies, it's not your fault and you have to go back tomorrow and do more work. You need to judge your practice. Did you scrub up properly? Have you done your continuing education? Did you approach the problem in the way that you're glad you did? And then if the patient dies, that's too bad, but you didn't kill them. You were just present when that happened. And if someone buys my book, I don't get all the credit. And if someone doesn't buy my book, I don't get all the blame. All that happened was I have a practice. I did my work and maybe they bought it and maybe they didn't, but that's not up to me. And I think that's the part of all of this is that this is an, it's, it's an endless 
reminding, learning, you know, we all go off on track and you kind of just got to nudge yourself back on again, course correct with what you're thinking, check in with who you're listening to. And I, one of the things that I, the, one of the favorite things in the book was when you're talking about marathon runners and you yeah. say the only difference between tens of thousands of people who finish the marathon and those that don't is the finishers figure out where to put their tired. Like this is going to happen. It's not going to be good all the way. And I think that that's something that I've learned is that once you can accept that there are going to be all of these moments, it isn't all going to be perfect. Then you just know that you're just, as long as you're still in the race, you're just still in the race. Correct. And then I just need to add one more thing, which is you're probably not as good as you think you are. Of course. And Never. You're, probably, you're probably not as bad as you think you are either. But in this moment, you might not be as good as you think you are. And so part of our practice is learning and exploring. That the, the unhappiest painters I know keep painting the same thing mm. and get angrier and angrier that their practice isn't paying off as opposed to them saying to themselves, can I honestly say that this work is worth talking about if you don't know me? Can I honestly say that I have explored something that people need exploring? Or am I hiding behind productivity? Because as we started with a little while ago, the world doesn't need any more paintings. It just doesn't. This has been so much fun. I know we're out of time, but I could have gone on. We had so many more questions. We, we left to like have you on again and go through the second batch of questions. But what a brilliant conversation. Thank you so much. Really inspirational. And I, I don't think you offended either of us with honesty or anybody who's listening, because I think we all need to hear that. Well, I miss my mom every day. And being able to talk about fine art is a, a treat for me. And I hope you will have me back because this was a great conversation and seeing the work the two of you are doing has been inspiring. So I hope you keep doing it. One thing that, let me start that again. <laughs> you can't say one more thing now because I finished, go on. <laughs> one thing that we often end with and sometimes one of us comes up with a better thing than the other is what's inspired you this week. So I'm rather putting you on the spot here and I'm asking you, what have you come across that, um, and we've changed it a little bit this year, actually, haven't we? It hasn't necessarily always been what's inspired, but it's what you've particularly enjoyed or what's lifted your week, something a little bit more personal. So I'm just going to hit you with that before we end. Do you really want me to tell you? Of course. It was Alice and Louise. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a cop out. You can't no, say not. that. You made both our days now. I don't have a long history of lying to people or pandering. <laughs> Watching people in the trenches who are doing work that isn't easy, that isn't obvious, with a practice, with the generosity you're bringing to it. That's why I show up. That's what this work is for. Well, thank you so much. Thank and we you. really, really appreciate both of your time. We, I have to say, neither of us slept well last night. We were both, <laughs> we both admitted this morning, we had a little chat earlier that we were both unseasonably a little bit nervous, but um, we both knew that you would be um, a, a fantastic person to talk to. And I think um, we're both going to go to bed very happy this evening. So thank you so much for your time. It has been fantastic. A pleasure. We'll see you. Keep making this ruckus. It matters. Hi, I'm Louise Fletcher, and together with Alice Sheridan, I co-host the Art Juice podcast. The conversation you were just watching was part of our 100th episode. If you're interested in honest, generous, and humorous conversations to feed your creative soul, check out Art Juice on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else that you get your podcasts.